if you're calling in love, then making sure that you're your best, most authentic self in every way is the best way to make sure that you meet the one that's the most right for you and the most healed and expanded and unblocked. It's about you being at the level of meeting a person that's appropriate for you at that time. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. Part of our manifestation process entails expanding past your limiting subconscious beliefs. Therefore, by tuning into this podcast with interviews from experts, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, scientists, and those with neural manifestation success stories, you're starting the process of expanding your subconscious in order to see to believe that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, the process begins. So today brings us to our final week of working through and looking at unblocked love together. May we be seeking partnership, exiting a partnership, super happy single and taking our authenticity deeper, or like the new mini workshop we put out, really looking at the triggers and our current partnership and how we can make that more magnetic. So I want to touch on a teaching. This is actually something I've been practicing for a while, but have never taught on before. So this is a brand new teaching and I call it a vision to hold on to. When we're going through this workshop together, I found myself practicing this, in fact, in my own life, because the way that, like I've been teaching on, you can go back a couple of episodes ago, that love and money are always connected. So while doing Unblock Love, a lot that's come up for me is actually looking at my love style, my trauma bonding, the way that I am in relationship through the new uh, mini workshop to heal it as much as I consciously can before my daughter comes into the world because I don't want to pass on the triggers and trauma that I witnessed growing up. So I'm really trying to break that cycle. So that's one aspect. Now where all of my tests are showing up and mirroring me, like I've been saying, is actually to do with finances or money. I say love and money are connected. And when I say money, people often think about, you know, they're like, well, I have flowing money or, you know, I don't. But money actually is just an energetic for security. And so is love, in fact. So money can be salary, your home, your dreams, your hopes. It it actually so much is tied to that. So that's where my tests have been showing up. And so going through the workshop, because I did Unblock Love and I've been participating in the new mini workshop, I really got to the root of how my security in love, again, looking at my triggers that I want to break the cycle on, as well as what's been coming up personally in my remodel and all of those great fun things I I sound like a broken record about, but so key to be going through because the way that I learn new teachings and new processes is always through rock bottoms in my own life. I had to do it through love (laughs) through dating and being a doormat through career. I've had to do it through self-worth every aspect of my life. So when I was really getting down to the root of where they're all connected, like I taught on two weeks ago, finding the patterning, the root, adjusting that. Then after that point, I practice a vision to hold on to. And I want to be very, very, very clear that this isn't visualization work. What this is, is it's another form of vision holding. So in traditional manifestation practices, people will vision board or they'll visualize. And again, I don't think those things are terrible by any means. I, actually, there's a lot of science that shows that they're quite great. But at TBM, we found what really works is actually finding expanders, you know, seeing to believe that something is possible. So, you know, if something you're manifesting, actually seeing that somebody has or is successful in or embodies what you want, however they used to be exactly where you are now or similarly. 
This is a little bit different. Something we used to teach on is called vision holding. It's what I experienced a lot through my ex's mom. You know, she really had this vision of me, of my perfection, my creativity, my beauty, my capability of doing anything. And I had very low self-worth and having somebody hold that vision for me actually expanded me. So this is another version of vision holding, and I call it a vision to hold on to. So after you've done all of the work in Unblock Love or the new mini workshop, you've really put together those patterns and you've gotten to the root of what's really going on to unblock right now, what to expand and what to pass tests on. I love to create this a vision to hold on to. And so it's where I show my subconscious where everything is headed based on past examples. So for instance, let's take the remodel. You know, I went through a very hard time remodeling the Forest House of North. We have a retreat up there. If you're not familiar, you can check the link below. It's up by Yosemite. And it took me six months to remodel that. And it was really traumatic for me. You know, it's just like fighting with contractors and over budget, over time, all that kind of good stuff that everybody deals with. However, I got to learn that after a certain period of time, it's like birth, you forget about all of that and you love and you're living your best life and happiness and this thing that you've created. So that's what I tend to do when I'm creating a vision to hold on to. It's what it will be like once everything has settled, once the trauma has integrated, once the expansion has taken place, once the manifestations have fully realized based on past experiences. So for instance, for me, this could be me. And when I wrote it out, it was really creating what the home will be like and what it'll feel like and what the land is going to be like, what will be growing on it. When the plants we've planted are very mature, what those will be like. It's that feeling to hold on to to know that it's coming. So this can be applicable to you in any way. If you're going through Unblock Love like you have been this month with us, and let's say you're going through a real rock bottom or a really hard place in dating, and you just keep meeting test after test after test, but based on past relationship positive experiences, once you do all of that patterning, you get to the root, you know what you need to unblock and how to expand and how to pass more tests, go ahead and create a vision to hold on to knowing where you are now in life based on seeing to believe to your brain, create that vision to hold on to what this experience will be like this next experience, especially knowing where you are authentically and what you desire. So that's something to practice. So the way you can do that is you just grab your journal after you've done your DI for the day inside of Unblock Love or the new mini workshop that's bundled with Unblock Love right now. And you get these real breakthroughs go ahead and just journal it out. You can you can journal it out like you would describe a scene in a book. You can list it, whatever feels comfortable to you. I just write a vision to hold on to. I underline it and then I just let the pen take off. And that's so medicinal and it vision holds and shows my subconscious brain and my new neural pathways. This is what's to come soon. And I know this to be true because of past experiences. So that's what sets it apart from just visualizing. So that's the teaching I want to get into today. If you haven't gotten a chance to jump on and do Unblock Love, again, it benefits everybody. It's what we've all focused on in community this month inside of our Pathway community group. If you're a member, we've been focusing on it in social media. If you don't follow us at To Be Magnetic, there's a ton of teachings on our Instagram grid from it this month. So hop on. It doesn't take very long to get through that workshop because we will be moving on next week to an entirely different new theme. And it's also your last chance to partake in the bundle before the price goes back to normal. Welcome back to another Explained episode, which has quickly become your favorite segment of the entire podcast, Expanded. In Explained, Dr. Tara Swart joins my co-host Jessica Gill and I in deep diving on specific themes within manifestation, which all of you love because it's where we bridge our process of manifestation with neuroscience and psychology and the deep science that anchors it all together. Back in July, Dr. Tara Swart joined us as our psychology and neuroscience advisor. And why we handpicked her, besides the fact that she's so unbelievably marvelous, she has a PhD in neuroscience and a former medical career as a psychiatrist of seven years. She's also a senior lecturer and on faculty at MIT, no big deal, and senior lecturer at King's College. 
She's currently working on research projects on plasticity and epigenetics. She has Google Talks, LinkedIn, Facebook, and two TED Talks. She's also the author of three books, her latest being The Source. So let's get into another Explained episode where Dr. Tara and I break down the energetics and science of manifestation, offering a roundtable perspective on the deep intricacies and connection. Here goes. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Expanded. We have an Explain today with Lacey and Dr. Tara. This one is all about love and relationships and partnership. So I'm going to kick us off with a quote. At the end of the day, we're all just mirrors showing each other where there's opportunity for growth. And I think it's a really good theme, you know, as we go into February and it seems to be Valentine's Day month every year. And I think it's just such a great opportunity to turn that love from, you know, the materialism of the holiday and the themes to that inner love and that inner self-love, because that truly is the source of, you know, our deeper connection to ourselves and how we connect deeper to our partners. So let's kind of start off in the beginning And Dr. Tara, I was interested in your take on this, but as human beings, we're so wired for connection and partnership. And obviously it it relates back to, you know, survival and evolutionary traits. Why is this such a deep neural pathway? Like, why are we so just wired to be craving relationships? Or I should say most of us or a lot of us are craving to be in relationships and feel safest in relationships. Yeah, absolutely. So you've kind of hit it on the head by saying it's evolutionary wiring, because if you think about when we lived in the cave, we had to exist as part of a tribe. You couldn't just go off and live by yourself. And that was for two forms of warmth. One is literally physical warmth, where we would huddle together, we would co-sleep, that was completely normal. And emotional warmth. So you got, you know, all of your, most of your pleasure was from kind of sitting around the campfire and spending time with the children in the tribe and everything. And if for whatever reason you were excluded from the tribe, it pretty much meant certain death. You couldn't survive the elements and provide enough food for yourself alone because it was such a group effort. So that's why it's so strongly wired into our brains. And and actually, even in the modern day, some of the algorithms that we use to test brain health and brain performance put social safety, which is your sense of belonging and your sense of identity in work and in life as the single most important factor to brain health and brain performance and twice as important as the next one down, which is physical exercise. But if you think about it, we've all experienced, you know, this sense of isolation and for some actual loneliness in the last year or so. And I think, you know, we've perhaps all felt more than ever before because it would have been quite imagined before what it's like to be really lonely and not be part of a social group and everything. I'm so curious too, like the difference between the sort of digital relationships that we're carving out now and that deeper in-person connection where you're physically experiencing someone with all five senses versus getting like a notification that you have a DM, you know, like is it weakening our connection because we are using devices and we're so removed and distanced from people? That's such a good question. So no, there's evidence and the research that I know about is from Stanford about the difference between physical in-person social contact and online contact. And so what it shows is that in terms of things like social anxiety and body image, and to some extent, other anxious-based disorders like eating disorders, that if you spend a lot of time online and not much time in physical presence with people, that contributes to all those sorts of negative outcomes. But if you spend a lot of time online and you do spend a lot of time in the physical presence of people, that's fine. And conversely, if you don't spend a lot of time online, but you don't spend time being social, that has the same negative effects as spending a lot of time online. So this need of ours to be social and physically present is very strong. One thing that I'm curious about, a little bit of a tangent and a little bit of a connection, but kind of going back to primitive tribal wiring, you know, there's this great little video on YouTube. We'll have to find it to link below. But when it talks about, you know, the author who authored The War on Drugs, 
he really talks about the success of people staying sober when they have their rat park. That's the analogy when they studied rats. So it's like when they would put a rat by itself, totally isolated in a cage um, and filled its water with opiate, it would just drink it until it died. However, when you would stick that exact same rat that's addicted to opiates into what's called its rat park, so it's a cage that has all of the cool little wheels, it has a ton of other rats to hang out with, they would put the water and the opiate next to the water. Some would try the opiate and be over it, and then some would just start drinking the water because they were so fulfilled socially you know, all the other elements that make them happy. So it's really interesting looking at that and kind of looking at what you were talking about in the tribe. Like if you were cast out, there was no way of survival and kind of just looking at all of the ways now that we numb in general, it's just really fascinating how important human connection really truly is. Yeah, I love that study. I haven't heard of that one specifically before, but it reminds me of another one, which is how when you experience unrequited love, which is usually after a breakup, although it it could be somebody that you love that doesn't love you. Then the, it activates the same pathways for drug and alcohol dependence. And that's actually why numbing dampens that down so that when you're just going through a breakup and that's all getting activated and it needs to be dampened down, drugs and alcohol actually do satisfy that requirement. So that's really scary because obviously you can see how that could be a slippery slope for someone. Oh, boy. I wonder if they can replace it with even numbing through like television or, I mean, phone addiction's not better, but a little bit, but, you know, like, I wonder if there's like slightly better numbing tactics to utilize there, too. I think it's what Lacey said, which is mostly if you've got, you know, a friendship circle or supportive family, that that's when you really need to turn to them because, left to your own devices, it can be really hard to resist that temptation because it's literally like being an addict, even if you're not one, because of the pathway activation from not having the love that you had or that you wanted. Well, that makes so much sense. Because when I think of like my worst breakup, quote unquote, I feel like it wound up being so difficult because I had moved to a new city and didn't have a solid friend group there yet. Definitely. This is actually, how toxic is this? That I look back at my greatest heartbreak ever that transformed me in every which way, even biochemically, my body changed. Like I lost my cycle for six months. It was just so hectic and wild. But I look back at it and I think it was one of the uh, most romantic, (laughs) (laughs) profound experiences of my life. And do we think that that's toxic, that there's like a drama attached to that? There's something I love about the chaos of it when I look back. I think that some people would be comfortable with that and some people wouldn't. So it's more to do with your previous history and what, you know, how you like to be, you know, psychologically and physically. But I would suggest that if you lost your cycle for six months, that that's actually an extreme stress response because, you know, that goes back to the cave because if you're under extreme, extreme stress, then, you know, your body prevents you from being fertile at that time. So obviously this is my background to be more like physiological than psychological necessarily. So I'd say if you lost your cycle, that's probably not a good thing, but (laughs) if you see it as, as pure romance, then you know, I think that's probably better for you because, you know, you don't want to remember six months of agony and heartbreak and torment. So I think in the end, it's a winner. Absolutely. Yeah. There's something really interesting there. And I can tell already feeling into it energetically that it's not healthy. And it's in the same way that my favorite films are always the most fucked up indie films. (laughs) You know, it's that kind of like artistic, poetic sadness and melancholy Uh, There's an attraction there that I have. It's a really fascinating thing. Well, although we don't, you know, obviously we don't throw around the term depression. When we do use it, we mean clinical depression. But there is such a thing as adjustment disorder with depressed mood that can happen after a breakup. It's an adjustment. Sometimes that actually temporarily has a depression of your mood. And sometimes it comes out differently. It might come in heightened anxiety or it might come in the way that it did for you, Lacey. You know, it would be very different for different people. People could have a period of huge promiscuity. They could have a period of isolation. It's about that adjustment. And it is possible to have temporarily disordered mood, but not have clinical depression. I think that's a great clarification for people. 
Yeah. And I think too, Lacey, you know, I definitely relate to the melancholy indie films and all of that. And just that like, oh gosh, they're never going to be together. And it's so sad and it feels so good at the same time. (laughs) I think there's also a bit of, you get to experience the human spectrum of emotions, even though they're sad and, oh, there's no happy ending to that love story as if we're painted, you know, from from childhood and Princess Disney films. The no happy ending and having to sit with that uncomfortableness is really intriguing in a lot of ways because it makes you face the shadow of that. It's like, how do you cope? How do you keep going? What feels, you know, how do you feel good on the other side of that? It's like you experience the full range of things within that one sort of dynamic. Yeah, the rawness of different different human emotions. And I lo- like as a former actress, I just I've always been so attracted to that. Never want to live in those spaces there. And I look back and I never want to be in there. <laughs> I just look back at it very romantically. <laughs> And then, Lacey, you've taught a lot and spoke a lot about relationships being mirrors for us, teaching us how to grow, evolve, where our work lies. How can we start sort of noticing, like, what's an example of this? And and how can people start noticing where those mirrors lie and even how those mirrors relate back to their caregivers and all of that from younger years? And you're saying in the context of when you're calling in love or just in general? Both. I would say, yes, when you're calling in love, definitely. I I think those are even harder to spot because we have like kind of our rose colored glasses on. But then even within relationships, like what's an example of, okay, when I'm reactive to this in a relationship, it's an example of my thing that I need to work on, not my partner's or whatever it may be. Yeah, this is such a great, interesting thing we've been talking about internally as a team because we're now releasing a tiny little aspect to the love course, but in partnership. People have requested that for so long. Dr. Tari, you hit it on the nose when you went through all of the workshops, giving it a science one, two, and like a cognitive one, two. And I've always felt this way as well, is that we've never really had in partnership inside of the workshop, because when something's happening, it's a reflection of you. (laughs) It's your mirror, you know, and I have great examples of this with Max. And again, I think all of us are mature enough in this audience and listening that this isn't in any case when you're dealing with physical, mental, verbal abuse of any kind, sexual, but, you know, we're just talking about a relationship dynamic that you're in, a partner dynamic. When it comes to manifestation work, in this work in particular, when something's coming up in the relationship, or I'll put it in context of myself, when something's coming up in my relationship, there was one time I remember early on that Max and I, I mean, once we became, we got into the level of intimacy, and I don't just mean sexually at all. I mean, like, shit's real because we both care, you know, and we're seeing into each other, see into me, into intimacy. All my stuff came up, everything, as it tends to do for people, and primarily my shadow and inner child wounds. And so I remember this point, we were in New York, and I just felt like Max wasn't totally connecting with me. And what I mean by that was he was so happy to have me there, but it wasn't like we were totally present and there together. And so anytime something comes up in our relationship, I'm never like, oh, Max is doing this and that. I'm like, cool, what am I doing to attract this experience? Because my projection is what I'm receiving from him always in this relationship. And it has always been the case in prior relationships. And that particular one, I ended up doing a deep imagining. And I got to the fact that my parents were really young when they had me. And that I was more like a doll to them because they didn't know, they weren't emotionally developed enough to be selfless around a child. They were 18 and 20. And therefore it was like fun to play with me and dust me off and, you know, take me off the shelf. But then it was really nice to put me back and like, you know, take me to my grandparents who could really parent me. So I was realizing that in this mirrored experience with Max, in this exact moment that I was more of on this trip, kind of like um, a trophy candy or whatever you want to put it. You know, I was his partner that was there. That was, it was more 
trophied, I guess you could say. And so I did this DI, there was no communication that happened with Max. And I really saw the shift in the healing in it. And bam, that's never come up again in our relationship, because I started projecting something entirely different. So it's really interesting that we've never actually put a piece in this workshop before of being in partnership, because most of everything that we're teaching and that what we're releasing is how to witness these triggers that are coming up in your partnered experience that you're being mirrored and what you can do to actively shift them and project something entirely different to receive something different, which is at the core of all of our work. So Atara, our coach has been working hard at that. You put great notes in on that as well, Dr. Tara, which I would love to give over to you because you were very eloquent and the way that you put it, that it makes sense for the workshop to be calling in your partner. But once you're partnered, it all comes down to your shit. Yeah. So I think that's about something that I've actually been really waiting to discuss with you, which is called transactional analysis. So transactional analysis is about, so imagine that Lacey and I are sitting across a table from each other and the person Lacey is talking to me and I'm speaking back with her, but underneath the table where we can't see is our inner child. They don't call it that in transactional analysis, but it's essentially that. So it's all the subconscious issues that you have. And so my inner child is constantly talking to me and saying things like, oh, Lacey's not looking at you the whole time you're talking. Maybe she doesn't like you. And so, you know, I'm having a conversation literally out loud with Lacey, but this conversation is going on internally for me and for Lacey. And then on some subconscious level, our inner children are speaking directly to each other. So that's what happens in a relationship when there's a trigger and it's blamed on the other person, is that there's something going on underneath the table that you're not aware of. And so what you see is the person sitting opposite you. So it's easy to project or blame it onto them. But actually, it's about a dynamic that's going on in so many ways, because in some ways, subconsciously, Lacey will address my inner child too. So if you think about these two people sitting at the table, there's Lacey speaking to Tara, there's Tara and her inner child and Lacey and her inner child both speaking within. Then there's the inner children communicating with each other. And then there's an impact that Lacey's having on my inner child and diagonally I'm having on hers. So there's so much going on. It's really difficult to you know, take that responsibility that at least 50% of it is with you. And it's easy to just stay above the surface because that's what you're really aware of. And I think that's what leads to those issues that it must be relational or to do with the other person because it's like you know that's just the tip of an iceberg that's so fascinating yeah I love that and I actually had a friend say recently she has a two-year-old and her and her partner have been in really healthy therapy since prior to having the child and I love when she said this week it was really hard to be my adult self which is such a beautiful way to nail it on the head where it's like I was exhausted this week or X, Y, and Z. And it's the stuff you talk about, Dr. Tara, about when you're eating healthily or sleeping well, yada, 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 you're a little bit more prepared to be your adult self. But most often than not, the person we're interacting with person to person tends to be our inner child. And I would say much more heightened in a relationship, an intimate relationship. Yeah. And there's also another sort of triangular element to a relationship, especially an intimate relationship where there's each of us can operate at three levels, which is adult, child or parent. So therefore, the interaction between us can be adult to adult. Or if I'm really tired and grouchy, the interaction between us could become you're still being an adult, but I'm being a child. And that might push you into being more parent like to try to manage me. So again, you can see how many combinations of that there are without you even necessarily being aware of it. And I guess so there is the goal to be adult to adult, or is it just to recognize when you're switching between adult, child, parent in that sort of triangular dynamic? The goal ideally is to be adult to adult, but at least on the way, if you understand that that does shift and and what makes it shift, then that's the journey, isn't it? I love just having those references because most often than not, In the morning, Max and I start out adult to adult, sometimes because he's not a a morning riser and he's exhausted and he needs two cold brews to get going. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, you know, up at five ready to party. It can often be a switch between me being an adult, he being his inner child, and then me becoming parent. But certainly in the evening when I'm exhausted from the day, 
our dynamic switches. So I love for people to even have that reference in their mind. Like, am I my adult self right now? Am I playing the role of parent to compensate with their inner child? Because I think that awareness can be so helpful. Sometimes we're lazy, man. Sometimes, you know, we're so busy. Who gives a shit? We just fall into the dynamics that seem to work. But I think when we're consciously trying to have a better relationship with one another, having those archetypes is so helpful to be like, oh, right now I'm playing another role aside from adult. Let me shift into that. Totally. Daniel and I also have this thing whenever one of us is like emotionally upset or triggered. It's almost like we both shift into the child and we're like, okay, let's go like sit down and cuddle for a second and (laughs) and like process and then we can talk about the emotions. But it's almost like we both have to tap into the inner child to be on that same page to cuddle for a a moment and then we can address whatever the person's kind of going through. That's amazing. That is certainly not how we do things. (laughs) That's actually really peaceful and kind. I've got my my hybrid of that is that we're like Lacey and Max, but the other way around. So I'm not a morning person, but my husband wakes up at five and vice versa. But we just generally do a lot of cuddling. So that's all bases covered in case anything goes wrong. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. And and what about that? Obviously, we know that oxytocin is released in that moment of cuddling. Like, What can we take away from that when conflict is arising in relationship or something's coming up that we often maybe don't address healthily? What are our options there? So actually, I'm going to slightly rewind to what I said, because it was almost as I said it that I thought something fell into place for me as you were asking the question, which is where I said we just generally do a lot of cuddling because that can kind of cover all bases, is that as with anything in neuroplasticity where you're cultivating a certain behavior, if you are having lots of physical contact and affection and you know, particularly skin-to-skin contact and other grooming behaviors, like you know how primates groom each other, which we do a lot of, then you are generally increasing your oxytocin levels, which means that it takes a lot more for that to get lowered beyond a critical threshold in a crisis or an argument or a tension. So, and really more than that, I would just say something more psychological, which is that, you know, if you're able to hold the bigger picture even during a crisis. So, you know, when you're a teenager, it's like if you have one argument, you broke up. And when you're older, you kind of realize that that's not the case, but you can take it even a level further than that, which is like, okay, we're having an argument right now. I'm not quite sure what's going on, but I'm looking for something that's constructive. And obviously Jessica and Daniel have taken that to the next level, which is let's (laughs) let's cuddle first. I don't think I could do that in the moment. Me neither. I'm like, get away from me. Don't touch me. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It doesn't work like that when we're angry with each other. Only if we're angry at like an external factor. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes it a little bit more realistic. (laughs) I still think it's really, it's it's such a good idea. So there's this other experiment that just completely fascinates me. And I think Lacey will like it because it's to do with prairie voles. So prairie voles mate for life. When they have mated, they have higher levels of oxytocin and vasopressin, and they have higher numbers of receptors for those hormones. And I really want to bring up the point here that hormones and neurotransmitters cover off very, very different capabilities. So We know that oxytocin is to do with love, but it's also physically to do with the process of giving birth and breastfeeding, not just bonding in a sort of more emotional way. And dopamine, we always talk about in relation to reward, but actually dopamine is most critical to movement. So movement disorders like Parkinson's disease that I did my PhD on is all about dopamine. It's just in a different pathway to the reward pathway. So vasopressin is actually to do with the water balance in our bodies. So it has an action on your kidneys. It prevents us losing too much water from our cells, but it's also to do with monogamy in prairie voles. So if you take promiscuous male prairie voles and you inject them with those hormones, they become monogamous. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> every, every girl's like, get me some of that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really fascinating because if that went to humans, they could just whew, spiritual bypass that. 
However, there is actually an epigenetic element to it, which is like not if you just inject the hormones, then, you know, it has that effect. But if you put voles that haven't mated yet in a cage together for six hours, and then you inject that into their actual brain, like in the area that it's activated, then they actually produce more receptors for those hormones. So that is a change that lasts and lasts generationally. So we're not talking about doing anything, you know, specifically similar, but we are talking about, I think it's like the difference between changing your subconscious limiting beliefs and just changing your thought patterns, isn't it? So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. Because I think that even the conversation on monogamy, it it seems like it's a combination of, you know, evolutionary trait. And then what you were kind of saying, Lacey, which is like, well, what was the modeling that was shown to you? And are you rejecting that modeling in order to find security? Like, are you going opposed? Let's say your parents had an unhealthy marriage, so you don't want, you know, one relationship. So now you're more primed to want a non-monogamy relationship. I think it's like the combination of those two play in. And I think there's another element where, and I think, you know, Jessica and I have similar examples here of, of things that have happened to us, where once you've had trust broken, you can project that onto someone else who may be completely monogamous, but you're, you haven't healed. So that can disrupt the relationship. And that's where I think the mirror piece comes in because if you've had trust seriously broken, then you could choose to become promiscuous yourself as a protective mechanism, or you could just not trust your next partner, even though, you know, that isn't their story at all. So that's why I think the inner child work and the shadow work are both equally important, because is it you opposing a role model that you saw, or is it you projecting something onto someone else because you haven't healed yet? Or is it their authentic code? They have to really do that inner work to figure out what dynamic. Mm, Yeah. And what does it show, Dr. Tara, for us is, because I I always wonder, I'm like, is monogamy that natural to us, you know, or is this a societal programming that we, we all kind of, you know, are conforming to, or we are unconforming to, and, you know, poly and the many different ways we can explore non-monogamy, what's going on there in the science? So in my TEDx talk that I did in 2015 on technology and the future of the brain, I, and I was thinking this when Jessica said about, you know, digitally connecting with people, that our brains have changed since we've had iPhones. We haven't actually had iPhones for that long, you know, in our, our lifetime. So our brains have changed since, since we've had smartphones. And, you know, relatively over the period of our lifetimes or, you know, longer generations, that's not been around for very long. So in a way, I think some of those sci-fi movies where people have intimate relationships, but they never have bodily contact, you know, who knows, maybe that's possible. But So what we do know is that brains change in the short term in response to some things that change in the world. And then 
there are changes that happen over many generations or, you know, millennia. And so with monogamy, when we lived in caves, it was more poly, basically. So so men were nomadic. They would leave the cave sometimes for long periods of time, sometimes never come back. And to ensure survival of the alpha male's genes, the alpha man or men would often impregnate four or five women before they left the cave. Because, you know, in those days, some pregnancies didn't go to term or like the baby could die of hypothermia or one could be eaten by a wolf or something. So four or five women who were fertile at the same time. And that's why we have menstrual synchronization, Mm. which mean that, you know, and again, you know, we don't need menstrual synchronization now, but we still have it. If the three of us worked from the same office every day, then eventually we would synchronize our cycles in only two or three months. I mean, it's hardly any time at all. And it'd be quite interesting to see who's we aligned to, because there is something to do with the hierarchy of the women in the cave as well, whose cycle you align to. Um, Wow. How interesting. Yeah, (laughs) I know. But um, so basically, for a long time, you know, monogamy wasn't the way that we operated in a tribe, but the tribe were like together as a unit and a family. So in our, our whole evolution since the cave, the time that we've been saying to people, our culture says you live in unit families that, you know, one couple stay together with their children, you know, as the sort of very cookie cutter model. That has been a relatively short time. And remember, that's not the case in all cultures in the world. But in the cultures where it is the case, we do see that a new father's brain gets rewired by oxytocin when a baby's born in a similar way to the, how that happens for the mother through childbirth and breastfeeding that didn't used to happen. Well, we didn't even really know that this happened till about less than 10 years ago. It's probably the biological imperative of why men do stay in unit families. But for a long time, it was socially asked for, but not biologically aligned. And now it seems that it's biologically aligned. So apart from the fact that the father's limbic system changes when he becomes a father for the first time and his testosterone levels drop, so he's more about staying in the house and protecting the the new mother and the baby than going out to compete. If the baby sleeps in the same room as the parents, the father's testosterone levels drop even further. So the balance of oxytocin and testosterone becomes much more about bonding than competition. Wow, that's so fascinating. I mean, like, obviously, there, you know, you see in different family dynamics, there's variation and other things come into play. But just knowing that that's kind of where our neuroplasticity lies within that, that's really interesting. And I think to to kind of piggyback off of these different dynamics and relationships and having the oxytocin kind of go to the brain, what is happening during, you know, what people call the quote unquote honeymoon phase? You know, what sort of bonding mechanisms are occurring at that phase? And then it seems to be the honeymoon phase and then shit gets real phase because then all your shadow and inner child comes out. But then there's also an opportunity later on for a deeper bonding and a deeper connection. What's kind of going on during those those stages? I think it's the honeymoon phase, the bonding phase, and then the growth phase. Is that sort of the deal? Well, Jessica and I were actually having a conversation before, which is that there isn't that much agreement about, there isn't like a fixed model. Okay. And, you know, I think the experience can be quite different for different couples. And especially, you know, as you mentioned earlier, that, Now there are often relationships that start later in life or, you know, a marriage with children and then a marriage either with new children or or not with children in the future. So there's, you know, the age at which your relationship starts, the age gap between you two, the history of the relationships that you've both had and, you know, any modeling from your parents, those factors, I would say, can change any kind of model. But, you know, sure, there are phases in a relationship, but I don't want to get too strongly bound to the ones that we looked at. So at first, there's just so many hormones going on. You know, there's a lot, the most of the physical contact goes on at the beginning of the relationship. And and again, where they say, you know, six months to two years, I think that's roughly right, but it's not going to be the same for everyone. So with that physical contact comes all the oxytocin and the sex steroid hormones like testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. And, you know, oxytocin literally lowers your guard, makes you feel all warm and fuzzy and you see everything in soft focus. And that goes along with what we speak about, which is this sort of level of illusion or delusion that you project onto somebody because 
that comes from your own trauma or inner child or feeling that they're going to cure or complete some of that in some way. And so there is definitely a period where we realize that that's not true, that they're not the person that's going to make all our problems go away. And either you then take responsibility for yourself or you feel resentment towards that person. And I really do agree. I think with either the passage of time or enduring some difficulties that if they don't break you apart, make you grow stronger and more together. But then also, if you throw children into the mix, there's the stages of having young children and then having teenage children and then children flying the nest. So that's why I think it's so complicated to really just talk about stages of a relationship. And it's quite hard to see another stage when you're in one. So especially if you're in the honeymoon phase, it's impossible to believe that you will ever be disappointed by that person. Someone said to me once, which I think is such a good phrase, like, you know, when you're first in love, you feel like you can conquer the world. And it's, you know, it's literally, there's such a good description of it. Well, it's really interesting in manifestation, harnessing that energy. It's such an unbelievably magnetic time because you literally aren't looping. I mean, I'm assuming like scientifically you aren't, but this is the way I'm seeing it energetically. You're not looping on any of the low self-worth behaviors. The world could be crashing down around you and your trust muscles so strong. I'll give examples. When I first met Max, I was at probably one of my brokest points ever. I hadn't actually launched manifestation yet. The universe was pushing me out of my nest of any comforts to do it, but it didn't matter because I was, I was in love and I knew I'm like, Oh, all the nets are there to catch me. It's like a montage of just everything working out for you. And so when you're in that space, just having some cognizance that Harnessing that for manifestation is very powerful because you don't have the normal limiting beliefs and things at your heels. Yeah, at least try to remember what it feels like. But that's why I think Jessica's point about self-love is so important because there is a way that you can conjure that up for yourself with you know, it not being dependent on an external person, which I think is super important. Ooh, let's hear about that. What are your tips for that? Eat a lot of chocolate. <laughs> Dark chocolate. You'd have to eat so much of it, though. I'm not sure that would actually be a really good solution. (laughs) My favorite thing for doing that is, I mean, you know, there's lots of things like journaling and gratitude. But my favorite thing for that is an exercise called taking care of the animal, where either in the shower or just when you're moisturizing your body, that as you touch each part of your body and either do it from head to toe or the other way around, that you sort of say like, you know, thank you to my hair for being so long and shiny and thank you to my skin for protecting my boundaries and thank you to my lungs for, you know, breathing oxygen into my brain or whatever. It actually works even if it's very external, but I like to do more sort of, you know, internal systems as well. And you just feel so good after it. It's like no less than getting a really big cuddle from the person that you're in love with. Could you say the same thing's possible from doing positive reinforcement DI? I love the magnetic self one. That makes me feel like that. Yeah. Okay. But there are others too, but that's like an obvious one, I would say, for feeling like that. That's interesting. First of all, that honeymoon phase is a hundred percent true because when I first started dating Daniel, I had I was booking more TV shows and projects than I ever had before. I felt like the best in my body. Like I didn't have any body image issues at that time. I was like, everything's fantastic. Like it was so great. And so when I think about, you know, okay, I want to feel like that in that phase again. And when I, you know, wake up and have mornings where I'm like, oh, I need to tap into that essence, I'll do the authentic code reinforcing DI or the reinforcing deservingness one. And then that will help like spark something to like step back into. It wasn't even what I was physically at that time. It was that mindset. It was releasing all of that programming. Mm -hmm. Or would you say chemically you're sort of bypassing it? Yeah, that's kind of what it feels like because it's like, well, it all came back after. So what, (laughs) you know, what, what happened? But I wasn't consciously doing the work. You know, I wasn't unpacking all of those things. They just were kind of removed temporarily. And now it's like about going in and finding each of those pieces and being like, okay, let's clear that one. Let's clear that one. I think that is, is super important because, you know, obviously you had that honeymoon phase and you're, you're still happily with Daniel. And, and even then you've said some of those things came back. So, you know, another sort of warning, and I'll share something quite personal, is that when my first marriage ended, 
all of the things came back, but I'd been married for so long, 11 years, and this person had told me I was beautiful and amazing and could do anything for so long that when suddenly that was taken away, I you know, had all these you know, negative thoughts and issues. And when I was in therapy, I, I was saying, you know, I very much felt that all of that negativity was because the marriage had broken down. And she said to me, what were you like before? And when I really thought about it, I realized that I was the same as I was before, but basically I'd been suspended from that reality by having a, you know, a very affirmative and supportive partner. So that's why I think this work is so important. Not, you know, because the relationship can go away, but also, you know, that honeymoon phase does usually go away. That if you do what we suggest, which is take a nap or have a massage or take a bath and then do a DI, then you're getting the benefits of the physical touch and the oxytocin, plus the more cognitive and belief-based benefits in your brain from doing the DI. I love that because it, it's almost like it gives you a glimpse into who you can be unencumbered. And then the work is really about moving that reliance. And I bet there's also something really interesting here with attachment theory and being anxious attachment and avoiding attachment within these relationships. But that helps you move almost too secure because you're not putting your validation and needing all of these things from the partner. You're now taking it back to yourself. And then, Lisey, this is a question we get asked a lot, which is, you know, manifesting while in partnership. What are the dynamics around that? What about if the partner is in low self-worth? Can you help them get out of it? Or can you both manifest together? How does that sort of play out? Yeah, we have I have an article I wrote a long time ago that we'll link below here calling in things with a partner. And really it comes down to that you guys have to be on the exact same page. That's really, really like energetically, that's what it all comes down to. And I think we may have talked about this in our episode of Love last year, but I'll sort of repeat if we did. So it really comes down to that you both have the exact same clarity. Say you're calling in a house together. That's a really common one we'll hear about a house or an apartment or, you know, whatever. You really have to have the core values, the core essences of what you want have to be aligned. So if one person's saying, yes, I want to call in a place in the city with you, but really in their heart and their soul, their authentic self is like, no, I'd actually like it to be in nature, but I'm actually doing this for my partner. Um, There's a confliction energetically. So it doesn't mean that you both have to want white walls and, you know, superficial things, but that your core essence you're both on the same exact page. The compromise isn't uh, forced. So that's a really key thing. And then secondly, yes, how quickly both of you are able to materialize it is based on, you know, it goes back to our, (laughs) our three fundamental rules. So are you expanded enough? Are you unblocked enough? And a great example of this is Max and I, we knew from month six into our relationship that we wanted to live in Topanga together. We would talk about it. We would cast lists together, but it took us uh, four and a half years to materialize that because we were both in different resistance areas, uh, whereas Max wasn't expanded enough for it financially. And and I became more expanded than he did. Like I could see the vision and how it could work. And he was watching the market. And then there was a point where I just literally physically couldn't live in the city any longer. And I gave him the ultimatum. I said, I'm going to go get my own rental out there and you can just visit me. And that was enough to spur him. So it's like, When you really are calling in together as a couple, it all comes down to being on the same page, both in clarity, what you're calling in, expanded enough, unblocked enough, and willing to pass tests together because you will be hit simultaneously. So we have an article, we'll link that below, but it really does just come down to this practice, what everybody knows about this practice, what they're practicing in the pathway. You're just doing it in unison with another person, which can be harder, but it also can be easier because both of you can kind of expand each other. So a great example of that, getting back to Topanga, Max turned to me a week ago and he was like, 
man, did you pick the perfect time for us to buy? Because when this pandemic hit, we actually got a really, really great deal on our place. And now it's unbelievable what homes are going for in Topanga because people are escaping the city. So, you know, it's really, you guys can really be vision holders for each other, but you can't force the other's process. I think that's something so important to learn very early on. That's the same thing, you know, we tell people, we're like, don't try to force your partner to do this work with you until they feel inspired based on what's transpiring in your life. And they're like, oh my gosh, I should do this. But that's why you can only lead a horse to the water. I really am a firm believer of that. I think being a projector, I've had to learn that the hard way, that you really, really have to let somebody have their process. You can't force their process in any which way in relationship. May it be manifestation, may it be their journey of growth in general, It really is an individual process. And, you know, we talk about this in the love workshop. I don't believe in the one. I really don't. I really believe that we have to continue to grow together and grow uh, autonomously in our own units, but together in the same direction, or that's when things outgrow or undergrow or, or fall apart a little bit. I completely agree with that. And I'm, I'm kind of glad that you came around saying that in the end, because I was, I was going to ask you which is that I love the way you've said in unison, but obviously apart from something like buying a house that you're both going to live in, I really believe that love is actually you both being on your own journey that you need to be on, but just together. And continual growth, I think, in personal journey. I think that's why we're here on earth. And you know, if you're spiritual and you believe in a soul coming around quite a few times, why else would we take another stab at it? It's really for growth. I think that's where partnership is the best reflection, the best mirror to help you grow. Because I don't know about you two, but my partner is my constant mirror. (laughs) And I think when I'm not with somebody, I've gotten very, very confident in being single, being autonomous and being alone, that I think my growth isn't nearly as rapid. Yeah, that was one of my questions too, which is like, what were some of the biggest blocks that being in a relationship, whether it's past or present, has allowed you to bring to the surface to heal? I'll start off. One that was huge for me was trust. And it's so interesting seeing the evolution because I can literally see the partner I attracted who cheated on me when I was younger to then my next relationship being in very like hyper vigilant, distrusting state because I was kind of like primed and like, oh, everybody does this. This is what happens to my now partnership, which is I can actually fully trust someone and I can release those issues. And so it was such an evolution of like, everybody cheats to, okay, no, they don't. This person didn't cheat, but I'm still nervous. What's going on to, oh, okay, not everybody cheats. And this is how I can feel safe within a relationship. So it was such an interesting evolution from one. And I needed all of those partnerships because I needed to take step by step by step in order to heal it. Yeah, I have so many examples in my past partnership. I mean, it's so interesting because love and money are so deeply connected, which we talk about constantly. And certainly you learn about that in the Unblock Love Workshop. But it's interesting how much my partners have helped me grow in a plethora of emotional ways. But it is because of them being my mirror that I, I can honestly say I'm where I'm at today out of my lack mentality. So my my last partner, he was an artist. He is an artist. And he also was a freelance graphic designer. And he was the first person to vision hold and expand me of how to make that transition out of the world of literally working in service. That's what I had been doing into becoming a freelancer, then into becoming an entrepreneur. And then in this current partnership, because he has success and he is so... I don't know how to put it, like unmovably supportive of anything I do. I could walk up to him and say, Max, I'm going to start the first town on Mars (laughs) before Elon Musk. Yeah, (laughs) he's like, Elon Musk is there. (laughs) (laughs) I know, Elon Musk is now the richest man in the world. All these things, right? All these obstacles, but I'm going to do it. And he'd be like, you are. Like he he's so there with me that he has vision held and expanded me out of lack. 
and out of that constant questioning my instincts in business, what I'm capable of achieving. So there have been so many reflections, so many things that all of my partners have helped heal me of. I mean, down to just the dynamics I watched my mom go through. God love her. She listens to this podcast, but she's like the ultimate black widow. She like has a baby and eats a man alive and spits him out. (laughs) You know, she really, and I had to really completely look at different modeling if I wanted to be in relationships with people that lasted a while and were healthy. Um, And my partners are all responsible for being the mirrors that allowed me to look at my behavior and held me accountable of that behavior no longer works. I need to go do some work to change, project something different so this relationship can show up differently. So it's, it's endless why I think the growth is so rapid in partnership. I have a version of what Jessica said as well. And how I came out of that in the end is that I just worked on being the most trustworthy, loyal person and not really worrying about what anybody else might do and just, you know, really focusing on on me being that person. But I had one, which is that with my first husband, who I was with for 11 years, he was very creative and artistic and really, you know, made things for the home and made the home beautiful. And, you know, I wasn't like traditionally creative and artistic. So I kind of started to feel like I didn't really have a sense of my own style for the home. And, you know, I'm very chameleon-like in terms of what I wear as well. So I was kind of okay with that, but I still thought, well, I don't really have like a style that's me. So when we got divorced and I first moved into a place of my own and I had to decorate it, that was like such a metamorphosis for me because... I created something that, you know, I mean, it was tiny, but it was so beautiful and I I loved it. And a really old friend came to visit and she said, it's so you. And so, you know, out of that relationship, which had a lot of good things in it, but that was one of the things that he did and I didn't do. Coming out of that, what I learned was I do have a sense of style. I, you know, have a very strong sense of what I want my home to feel like. And that's what I was thinking. I think that definitely works because it's really, you know, the core of the question is just what are blocks that you've sort of worked through allowing yourself to be in a relationship past or present? And so that was the block of not being in touch with your sort of creative style or style of your home and being able to see that come to surface through the relationship and then the ending. Absolutely. And because we seem to attract one of our caretakers most often than not or elements of them. Don't you feel like partners are the greatest gift to work out all of those inner childhood wounds? That's why it kind of makes sense that we've never really had a huge in partnership manifestation course. We're now just putting out this guide of how to take the triggers coming up to take a deeper look at where you need to unblock. Yeah, because nobody else is going to trigger you like that. You know, it's your primary caregivers and then your romantic partner. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the biggest, you know, advice I would give anyone in, in relationship right now would be absolutely wherever blocks or issues are coming up, do that inner work on your own. You don't need a partner to do it. Work on boundaries and inner child and shadow and all of that internally And then get really good at conscious communication and you're in such a good space. What advice would you have for people calling in partnership right now? Obviously, we have Unblock Love, which is stacked with how to call in your partner. But what about people who are like, oh, my gosh, I want a relationship after listening to this episode? Yeah, I mean, the the greatest and biggest, it really is do unblock love because that that has literally the syllabus for it. But it's really starting to assess and find your worth outside of all of the conditioning that you have experienced that continue to maybe keep you in or have put you in a position of not seeing results that you desire, meaning maybe you're continually a doormat or maybe you're continually attracting in the person that's not emotionally available or or maybe you got out of the relationship that couldn't meet you where you're at. It really comes down to looking at your deservingness and your worth and what's standing in the way of what you truly desire and are you expanded enough for it. Although in Unblock Love, (laughs) it'll get a lot deeper. You're going to go through figuring out trauma bonding. There isn't the one. The Disney 
uh, myth and it really helps to take the veil off and it takes you to a core place that shows you how to find it from your worthy, whole, expanded, unblocked self. And what about you, Dr. Tara? Yeah, so I would probably take it even further, perhaps because of the order in which I did the workshops and say that if you did the basics bundle, how to manifest unblocked in the child and unblocked shadow, then you're at your best self. And because from psychotherapy, you meet somebody at the deepest level of your trauma, I would say that if you're calling in love, then making sure that you're your best, most authentic self in every way is the best way to make sure that you meet the one that's the most right for you and the most healed and expanded and unblocked. Because I completely agree with Lacey that there is no one. And it's about you being at the level of meeting a person that's appropriate for you at that time. Absolutely. And then just a little closing exercise for everyone at home. So if you are calling in a partner, perhaps take some time this week, this month, review your list and kind of note, you know, are you calling in aspects that you haven't integrated to yourself yet? Are there items that you can add to your list about how you want to feel in your relationship, such as able to communicate your feelings respectfully, et cetera, et cetera, and then take those things through unblock love. And then for those who are in partnership, Take inventory. What are the ways that there's maybe friction in your relationship and how can you start to take accountability and look inward and start to work through some of those triggers and check out the new Unblock Love partnership update? Amen. (laughs) Yeah, thank you guys so much. This was such an expansive episode. I'm like so interested in re-listening to it after we finish recording. Thank you for hosting, Jessica. And thank you for all of the the science insight. I learned so much on this episode from you, Dr. Tar. It was really, really great. This is a really sciencey one. I love the prairie bowls. I couldn't resist oh mentioning them. <laughs> There's going to be a deep YouTube Google after this. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a wonderful month and week, everyone. Speak soon. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this, you'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the WISE, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week.